Well, we've made it to the final section in this glorious letter from Paul to Timothy. Paul started by addressing Timothy as his true son. Paul was Timothy's spiritual dad. And this whole letter has been quite an urgent appeal from Paul to Timothy, highlighting the dangers of the false teaching that was creeping into this church. And here in this final section, the urgency escalates as Paul starts by saying, but you man of God, guard what has been entrusted to you. So Timothy, my true son in the faith, Man of God, God, what has been entrusted to you. And all of this is framed with an eternal perspective. And so I called the sermon I preached on this section, the life that is truly life. Now, as always, I really do encourage you, go read through this section for yourself a number of times. Try and see this repetition on eternity, on the life that we are headed towards our great hope that is ours because of Jesus. So look out for that repetition and look out for the warnings and the urgency. Look out for the commands or the charges that Paul gives. And as always, I'm going to take some time to show you what I've seen in this passage. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you, pause the video, take some time to pray. Ask God to open your eyes to see wonderful things about him and to understand the urgency of what Paul is saying here. Before we dig into the other details, I just want to show you this uh, focus on eternity, eternal life. So take hold of the eternal life until the appearing. He's talking about when our Lord Jesus returns to usher eternal life in, in God's presence. At the end of verse 16, Paul speaks of uh, the honor and might of, being given to God forever, as could also be translated, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Paul speaks to the wealthy about getting their hope set in the right place as a firm foundation for the coming age that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And then when he says to Timothy, O oh, Timothy, God, what has been entrusted to you, God, the deposit, God, the deposit that's been entrusted to you, a deposit is a down payment guaranteeing our inheritance. So it's also talking about hope. So hope is a central theme in this whole section. And hope has been there from the very beginning of the letter. In chapter one, verse one, Paul spoke of being an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior. Salvation has been in the spotlight. And then he says, of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. It's been there since chapter 1, verse 1. And in this section, Paul is putting the spotlight on hope, eternal life, uh, the appearing of our Lord Jesus, that hope, which is life that is truly life. He wants Timothy to get this right. So this was in chapter 1, verse 1. And then he starts this section by saying, But you, O man of God. So he is contrasting what we just saw in the previous section. But you, O man of God, flee from all this. So flee from the love of money and the evil that comes from it, the, the conceit and the conspiracies and the corruption. Flee from all that. But he says, but you, O oh man of God, and that man of God language is used throughout the Old Testament for great leaders of God's people. So we see Moses is called a man of God. In 30, Deuteronomy 33, verse 1, uh, we see David is called a man of God. In Nehemiah 12, verse 24, uh, we see Samuel is called a man of God. 1 Samuel 9 verse 6. And then both Elisha and Elijah and Elisha are called uh, O man of God. So this phrase, but you O man of God, Paul is linking Timothy with big leaders from the Old Testament. With Moses, David, Samuel, Elijah, Elisha. He's 
wanting Timothy to feel the weight of the role that he's in as the shepherd of God's household, the shepherd of God's much loved people. And this title indicates a person who represents God and speaks in his name. So it is a massive title that Paul starts this section with. And then he gives him a number of commands. We see these as imperatives throughout this section. In Paul's letter, it's always worth looking out for the imperatives. So the, the verbs that are commands. So there is one. So in the first two verses, uh, four imperatives. Now this one is the central imperative out of the four. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called, because he fleshes that one out in great detail. Because if Timothy could get this one right, take hold of the eternal life to which he was called, then he would be able to flee, pursue, and fight really well. There's another imperative that comes uh, later in the section, command those who are rich. And then right at the end, a final imperative. So it's worth looking out for these in Paul's writings, these, these verbs that are commands, and they really put the, the focus on what Timothy, the man of God, is to do. So some have helpfully called these the flee, follow, fight. But Timothy is called to flee from all this. So as I said earlier, the love of money and the evil that comes from that. Flee from all that. Flee from everything that the false teachers are bringing in to the church. Rather pursue uh, righteousness, godliness. Faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Now, godliness is something that we've seen uh, a lot throughout this letter, right from the end of chapter 3, where Paul said that the mystery from which true godliness springs is great, and he tells us of the gospel. Godly living springs from us being saved by Jesus and now wanting to live for Jesus. And he's saying, pursue righteous living and godly living so righteous living we are counted as righteous because of Jesus and Paul is saying pursue that live as a righteous person in becoming more and more like Jesus daily pursue godliness as you hold up the truth pursue faith faith has been a key theme through the in the letter as well if you go and track it through the whole of 1 Timothy you see Paul has spoken of this faith that is ours in Jesus and he's warned against placing your faith in anything other than Jesus. So he's saying, pursue, follow faith and love. Love God. Love his people. Love his gospel. Pursue these things. Then pursue endurance. Keep on keeping on. And gentleness, well, gentleness is the opposite of what we've seen the false teachers to be. We saw in the previous section that the false teachers are conceited. And they uh, cause strife between people. They cause fighting and quarrels. Where he's saying, actually, pursue gentleness. So pursue these things. Flee, follow, fight. Fight the good fight of the faith. Paul uses this word good a number of times. He's saying, fight the good fight. Remember your good confession. Remember Jesus' good confession. Later, good works. Um, he also says she has a firm foundation or a good foundation. Uh, it's the same Greek word. But here he's saying fight the good fight of the faith. The fight he's calling Timothy to is the struggle to live out the faith, to actually hold on. It's like he's in a long race, a marathon, and he's saying fight to hold on to your faith. And that's why, as I said, this take hold of the eternal life is really the the central um, imperative in this opening section. He's saying, really, if you take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, then you'll be able to flee from all this and pursue all this and fight holding on to your faith. He says, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession. And he speaks about Jesus' good confession. Later, there's a repetition there. And that good confession is his declaration of his faith at his baptism, where he stood in the presence of many witnesses and said, I believe, I believe that Christ Jesus came into the world to save a sinner like me. 
And the good confession before Pilate was Jesus staying, holding on till the end, right to the end of his life, and where he said, I am the Christ. An important thing to see in here, he says, take hold of the eternal life. What is the greatest thing about this eternal life? Well, it's an eternal life with God. We see God in the focus, man of God, in the sight of God. God will bring about that appearing. And then he, this whole section is highlighting what a great God he is. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Hold on to the eternal life because, because of Jesus, when he appears again, you will be with this God. The one who is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, you'll be able to approach because of Jesus. Whom no one has seen or can see, one day we will see him because of Jesus. Jesus has made all the difference in history and Jesus has made all the difference in our lives. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and Paul is saying, take hold of the eternal life to which you are called. When you were saved, when you made that good confession and said, I believe, take hold, hold on tight to that eternal life that is now yours because of Jesus. And with the weight of these imperatives hanging over, he then says, I charge you to keep this command. Now that I command you, I charge, charge those who are rich, command them to do good. So this type of language we've also seen uh, a number of times in the letter so far. The first charge came in chapter 1 verse 3. Charge certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Tell them to keep quiet. Another charge in 4 verse 11. 5 verse 21 before the heavenly court. Where he says I charge you before God and Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions. That was all about the choosing of elders those who would look after the church. And here again he says, I charge you to keep this command. The command here is to hold on to eternal life. Keep it. Keep holding on. Keep going. Remember your hope. Remember that Jesus is coming again. Keep this command without spot or blame until Jesus returns. God will do it. God, the almighty God, will bring about Jesus' return in his own time. God is the Almighty God, and if he says he'll do it, he will do it. So Paul is urging Timothy, take hold of this eternal life to which you are called. Don't let go. But not only did Timothy, the man of God, the leader of God's people, need to take hold of eternal life, the people in his church also needed to. And so Paul focuses in here on the rich. We've already seen from the beginning of chapter 6, uh, that there were wealthy people, there were those who owned slaves. Um, we saw in the previous section here in chapter 6 uh, the dangers of riches. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It clearly was a big issue in this church in Ephesus, it was causing people to wander away from the faith. But Paul doesn't say, tell the rich to give everything away. Rather, he shapes their thinking to know how to use their riches. He says, don't place your hope in your wealth. Don't be arrogant, because riches can make a person arrogant. Remember, your wealth is uncertain. It could be gone tomorrow. But rather, put your hope in God. God is the one who richly provides. All of this riches comes from him. He gives us everything we need for our enjoyment. That's important to see. It's not wrong to enjoy the good gifts that we get from God. God has given these things to us for our enjoyment. So enjoy them, but don't put your hope in them. And then how will you know if you're putting your hope in your riches or not? Well, you'll know if they're not in your riches, if you're willing to actually use your riches to, to be good. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. And he makes it absolutely clear what he means to be generous. 
and willing to share. If God has given to you, use it for the good of others. Be generous, be willing to share. Invest your wealth in a way that will have an eternal impact. That's what he says here. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Eternity is in view here. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. He's urging these rich people to also take hold of the eternal life to which they were called. They weren't called just to a life of uh, enjoyment in earthly terms to put their hope in that. No, they've put their hope in Jesus who came into the world to save sinners. And if they have been saved by Jesus and given riches in this world, then God has also given the gift, given them the gift of generosity. He's saying, use what you've got to lay up treasures in the age to come. Use what you've got so it will have an eternal impact. This is one worth digging into with those who you teach, digging into personally. How can we use the things God has blessed us with to truly be a blessing to others? So that others might come to know Christ Jesus who came into the world to save sinners. And so that others might truly understand that truth and live in the light of that truth. So Paul is commanding. It's a command, not a suggestion. Command the rich in this world. Command them to be generous as they take hold of the life that is truly life. And then in the very final verses, Paul says, there should be an O here. It's sad that the NIV dropped that out. O Timothy. It's a real cry of the heart. O Timothy, next command, God. God what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from the godless chatter. We've heard about that throughout the book and we've seen how destructive that is. Turn away from that. Turn away from what is falsely called knowledge. Uh, some have taken this to, to be an early form of Gnosticism, uh, those who, who claim a higher knowledge. Anyone who comes in and says that they have a, a higher understanding, a new uh, word, something else, beware. He says, turn away, avoid, because some who have professed this godless chatter and this knowledge that is other than the truth, in doing so, they've departed from the faith. That's absolutely devastating. We heard this word, departed, already in, uh, in cross-reference, chapter 1, verse 6, where it says that they've deviated, they've wandered away, they've swerved, they've departed from the faith. How devastating. We saw a similar thing at the end of last week's passage in 6, verse 10, that they have wandered away. Now, the reason that Paul is pleading with Timothy, you, O man of God, O Timothy, God, what's been entrusted to you, is because whatever these false teachers were teaching, this godless chatter or this new, higher knowledge, was clearly mesmerizing. There was something about it that, that made people, that drew people away. And even Timothy himself, the man of God, was in danger of being drawn away by this, what is falsely called, knowledge. And so Timothy, uh, Paul is pleading with Timothy, don't, don't go away. Guard what's been entrusted to you. Guard this truth. Guard it by preaching it and by living in a way that holds this truth up. And how are you going to do that well, Timothy? Well, by taking hold of the eternal life to which you are called. Remember your hope. And then Paul ends with this great word, grace. Grace be with you. The original uh, you here is a plural. So the NIV has helpfully translated this in the plural. Grace be with you all. Which shows us that although this is addressed to Timothy, the man of God, it's a letter for the whole church. Grace be with you all. The whole church needed to hear this message. They needed to know what to flee from. They needed to know what to pursue. They needed to know what to fight for. The good news about Jesus. And in order to do that well, Paul says, take hold of the eternal life to which you are called. Have an eternal perspective. Remember your hope. I charge you, keep this command. 
guard this good deposit. Take hold of the life that is truly life. So as we come to the end of this incredible letter, we need to hear the urgency. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. God our Savior wants all people to be saved and to understand the truth. The problem is false teaching so easily comes in and can distract us, lead us away, cause us to depart from that truth. And so Paul is saying, hold on to the eternal life. Hold on to what Jesus has secured for you. Life that begins now and continues forever. Hold on to it. Live a godly life that points the world around you to Jesus. If you're rich, use what you've been given. Uh, invest in eternity. Take hold of the life that is truly life. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Guard it by rejoicing in the gospel, by telling it to others, and, to, and by living in a way that holds up this truth. And so, we need God's grace in order to do this. It's grace that, by which we are saved. It's grace by which we continue. And it's grace that will lead us home. Well, as you dig into this further and think about how we can take hold of these eternal, glorious truths, that day when we see God face to face and he wipes away tears, where there'll be no more crying or dying, be encouraged and take this seriously. Take hold of the eternal life, the glorious life to which you are called. Well, God bless as you dig in further. <music>